All right, hello and welcome everyone. I'm so glad that you've all been able to join us today. My name is Keith Cernick. I am the Chief Science Officer for the Institute for Mental Health Research. The IMHR mission, for those of you who uh, may not be familiar with us, right? our mission is to provide funding to Arizona-based research scientists seeking to answer the most pressing mental health challenges through the conduct of timely and innovative research. One of our other uh, uh, major focuses is to share information about mental health knowledge that's been accrued through research and to make sure that we get that information out to folks who can use it and, and can really uh, put that knowledge to, to good use. Now, because we encourage you to be an active participant in this webinar event, I wanna guide you through the Zoom features that will make this easier for you. Please use the Q&A button for questions that are directed at our presenter. The Q&A allows questions to be moderated by me, which will help us move through them as efficiently as possible. If you have a technical question, however, please use the chat button and we'll respond to you in that way. And we ask that you participate in the polls that we are sharing. There are two polls in all, one at the very start, as you've already seen, and another that we'll share towards the end. If you're on social media, please feel free to post about this event at hashtag IMHR webinar. And lastly, we do want you to know that we are recording this webinar. A link to that recording will be sent to you in a few days and feel free to share it with friends and colleagues. Now, the results of the first poll, hopefully we have some information that we can share. I don't know if we have those available yet or not. Okay, well, I don't see those up yet. So if we can get those later, we'll try to share those at some other point. Um, now, today we are gonna be discussing aging and cognition. And I'm very pleased to be moderating this important discussion as these are issues that we all must grapple with at some point in our lives. Learning more about what mental health research can teach us has the potential to not only help the patients and clients with whom we work, or our own families, or our communities, but also ourselves. Our guest today is Dr. Jordan Karp, who happily for us serves on the IMHR's uh, Scientific Advisory Committee. Dr. Karp is the chair of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Arizona's College of Medicine and the medical director at Banner University Medicine in Tucson. He's a renowned geriatric psychiatrist celebrated for his work in late life depression, as well as for work in promoting brain health and aging. He has published extensively in these fields and his work has been well-funded by the National Institutes of Health, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, and the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. The title of today's presentation is Preventing Cognitive Decline in Late Life, Evidence-Based Ways to Maintain Brain Health. Dr. Karp, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Keith. Um, let me share my screen and we'll get going. Keith and Angel, are you able to see this? Yes, I am. Okay, good. Well, it's an honor uh, and a pleasure to spend some time with you all this morning. Uh, and greetings from sunny Tucson. It's so cool to see people from Nepal and Greece and the UK joining. So uh, thank you to all of the participants. Um, this is my disclosure slide. And this is what I'd like to chat about with you today. So we'll start with a, an overall discussion about aging and maybe some shared definitions and then transition to some biological pathways that are um, in many instances ubiquitous and inevitable, but um, there may be some ways to deviate in a positive way from the inevitability of uh, some of the problems of aging. I'd like to talk about the incidence of cognitive decline and dementia, and then we'll end with a discussion of some risk factors for cognitive decline and dementia, and what you can do to protect your brain and maintain cognitive reserve. And cognitive reserve is a concept that we're going to uh, talk about quite extensively this morning. 
So I think it's useful to assure that we are on the same page with what defines aging. And I like this definition, that it's commonly characterized as a progressive generalized impairment of function resulting in an increasing vulnerability to environmental challenges and a growing risk of disease and death. And that's important to, to remember that it increases our risk. I, I like to think that aging upsets our sense of homeostasis or our ability to maintain biological, physiological, and psychological balance in the set of increasing stressors that are often associated with aging. So I'd like to talk about some pathways that link aging and aging-related disease. And I'm gonna walk you through this figure. I hope that it will make sense and sort of set the stage for what we'll be chatting about the rest of this morning. So we all have intrinsic or internal factors that um, uh, uh, increase in severity and intensity over the course of our lifespan and increase our uh, risk of disease and go hand in hand with the process of aging. So oxidative damage, hormonal changes, and the set of genes that we were dealt at birth all uh, increase our risk of uh, aging and aging related diseases. And they intersect with environmental factors, many of which are modifiable, such as smoking, excessive alcohol use, physical inactivity, and exposures to toxin and radiation. Um, all of these, this intersection of both the internal, the, the uh, nature and the, the nurture, the environmental, uh, variables contribute to cellular damage and repair. And from birth, our cells are dying, they are becoming ill, and they are repairing. And the ability to repair can become impaired over time. This cellular damage alters tissue function. So the tissues that make up our lungs, our brain, our heart, our kidneys, our skin is changing over time. And when repair outweighs or is in excess of uh, it, when damage is in excess of repair, it can affect organ function and contribute to disability and vulnerability to mortality. Now, as I said, this everybody uh, moves along the trajectory towards an aging phenotype. It is universal, ubiquitous, and inevitable. But it is not inevitable for every disease uh, uh, to develop that is often associated with late life. And the goal is to selectively prevent certain disease phenotypes that are associated with aging. And cognitive decline is one of those that, that we're gonna be discussing today. So there's different ways to characterize or qualify successful aging, uh, engagement with life, finding meaning and satisfaction and meaningful relationships is important. Avoiding disease is critical. But today we'll talk about maintaining high cognitive reserve and associated physical function. So I want to share with you some key messages about cognitive aging because this concept of cognitive aging may be new to many of you. So the brain ages just like any other part of the body. The brain is responsible for cognition. And as a geriatric psychiatrist, as a clinical neuroscientist, to me, this is a term that describes mental functions, including memory, decision making, processing speed and learning. So the ability to acquire, register, recall, um, and use new knowledge uh, and place it in, in new contexts. As the brain ages, these functions can change. And this is a process called cognitive aging. I wanna reinforce that cognitive aging is not a disease. It is not the same as Alzheimer's disease or other types of dementia. It's a natural lifelong process that occurs in every individual but it's different for everyone. And some people may experience very few effects while others have changes such as uh, impairment in carrying out daily tasks like paying bills, driving and following recipes. I think that the most common example of normal cognitive aging is word finding difficulties. And I imagine there's many uh, participants in today's webinar who are smiling and nodding their heads. Uh, the ability to find a word or um, uh, remember a name that could be on the tip of your tongue, but you just can't access it. That's a normal part of cognitive aging and not necessarily a harbinger of uh, a dementing illness. There's some good things 
also about cognitive aging. So, so some cognitive functions improve with age, such as wisdom and knowledge and well-being. And these often improve with or increase with age and older adults may report greater levels of happiness and satisfaction with younger adults. And I remember several years ago, my father said a wise and interesting thing when I, I asked him if he was happy. And he said, I'm not sure if I would describe every day as happy, but I'm content. And I think that content is for many people a good goal and it is on the positive valence of the spectrum of, of well being. But um, this has been replicated many times, this U shaped curve. Let me walk you through the figure. So on the X axis here is the a ages from people from 18 to 21 up to 82 to 85. This is the well being ladder. Uh, lower is worse well being, higher is greater well being. We see that younger folks, 18 to 21, have very high levels of well being. There's a dip during middle age, and then this increases again in late life. There are steps that people can take to protect their cognitive health. And again, although aging and cognitive aging is inevitable, it's possible to promote and support cognitive health, cognitive reserve, and adapt to age-related changes in cognitive function. And again, we're gonna come back to this concept of cognitive reserve. And I'd like to define it for you. So I think of two types of reserve capacity when I'm thinking uh, of function of the neck and above. So there's cognitive reserve, brain function, and there's brain reserve, so brain structures. And you can think of cognitive reserve as how effective or efficient the brain is in carrying out tasks. And brain reserve is how efficient or how intact are the tissues that make up the organ of the brain. And this MRI of a brain shows a pretty intact looking brain. There's no space occupying lesions. I don't see a lot of neurodegeneration. I don't see a lot of vascular disease. This is a pretty healthy brain. So let's talk some more about cognitive deserve, reserve and how it may lead to an earlier dementia diagnosis. And, and I'm gonna walk you through this diagram here. So on the x-axis here are years. This is say, younger, like midlife, this is old age. On the y-axis here is cognitive function and reserve. This is higher cognitive reserve, lower cognitive reserve. This dotted line here is the threshold that people may cross in terms of their cognitive performance that uh, below this line would be indicative of dementia. The red line sh is uh, showing people with no brain challenges, so people who have not ex been ex exposed to a neurodegenerative disease, uh, depression, traumatic brain injury, um, they don't have diabetes or high blood pressure, and the green line is the challenged brain. So let's look at the left. We see here that in earlier life, uh, those who do not have any brain challenges start out with greater degree of cognitive reserve, and those who have some kind of disease or um, uh, psychological or psychosocial disability may start out with uh, lower cognitive reserve. So those with lower cognitive reserve, as they move along the lifespan, are more likely or they cross the threshold to dementia earlier if they are developing this disease because of vascular or neurodegenerative processes, while those who have a higher level of cognitive reserve have a different trajectory and it takes longer for them to cross the threshold to dementia in the face of underlying pathophysiology. So this is really the sweet spot here. How do we prevent the, this earlier onset of dementia and move it to farther out in life? Well, I said I would share with you some statistics and I think it's important to really uh, grasp the, um, the scary immensity of uh, the burden of dementia. And worldwide, about 55 million people have dementia. And I'm especially troubled that 60% of these cases are in people living in low and middle income countries who have less resources and ability to care for these folks than we do in higher income countries. As the proportion of older people in the population around the world uh, continues to grow, uh, by 2050, it's expected there'll be 139 people living with dementia. So the United States government is very worried because Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, this is an acronym that you may hear elsewhere. It's called ADRD because not every dementia is related to Alzheimer's disease could be on track to bankrupt the country. Now, I'm exaggerating a bit, but it is a big price tag. 
So dementia is costly, and it's expected that the annual costs may soar to $511 billion. This is in the United States by 2040. If we think about the number of people in the United States now, and this is from the Alzheimer's Association website, there's 5.5 million people in 2018 in the United States living with dementia. It's projected that by 2050, there'll be close to 14 million people living with dementia. So what's the government doing about it? The National Institute of Health budget in 2021 is about $43 billion. The National Institute of Health is made up of these different institutes. One of them is the National Institute of Aging, which uh, focuses on aging-related illnesses, conditions, and a large amount of money of the $3.9 billion that is earmarked for the National Institute on Aging is, is dedicated for Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, almost $3 billion, and that was increased $300 million uh, this year compared to last year. So this is about 6% of the total NIH budget. But when we think about the total costs that this is going to cost the United States over the next 20 and 30 years, we may want to reconsider increasing our investment in Alzheimer's prevention and treatment uh, uh, investments. So I'd like to share with you just a little bit more about the burden of the disease and the cost. And this is an article some colleagues and I prepared in 2018, and we published in the American Journal of Geriatric Psychiatry called Stopping Cognitive Decline in Patients with Late Life Depression, a New Front in the Fight Against Dementia. And I'll just read a little bit about this. So prevention may be elusive in the near future, but just slowing down the decline could have a huge benefit. If discovered and disseminated by 2025, so just four years from now, such an intervention could reduce these cases 30% to 5.8 million from 8.2 million. And the projected cost savings of such an intervention are 83 billion in 2030, rising to 367 billion by 2050. These numbers are so huge, it's hard to wrap your mind around. But the important thing is to remember is that if we hit some of these important modifiable risk factors, we can reduce the burden um, by delaying the onset of dementia. So let's talk about some modifiable risk factors for the prevention of dementia. And the, the National Academy of Medicine said that there may be some possible benefits from three types of interventions. So cognitive training, blood pressure management in those with hypertension, and increased physical activity. The, these make good sense. I've been paying more attention to the Lancet review of population attributable risk, which was just reconvened in 2020 uh, and is a really accessible, um, very in, a smart approach to reducing the burden across populations. The Lancet review says that 40% of dementias could be prevented by modifying 12 risk factors. So I'm gonna read these. And as I do, I'd like you to think about whether this is something that affects you or it's something that affects someone you love um, as we think about ways to modify our shared risk. So low education, midlife hearing loss, obesity, hypertension or high blood pressure, late life depression, smoking, physical inactivity, diabetes, social isolation, alcohol consumption, head injury, and air pollution. So you might wanna write some of these down and uh, we can discuss them during the question and answer session. I'm, I'm particularly concerned about the first one and the last one, so low education and air pollution. If you think about it, these are risk factors that, that preferentially affect poor people, people without means or resources. And uh, while many people on the call to, or the webinar today may not have experienced this, it is, I think, our obligation to try to improve the world by attending to those who may not be able to speak or advocate for themselves. Although with the way the world is going right now and Salt Lake City being considered the most polluted air quality in the world because of the fires, uh, this is going to become uh, uh, an increasing concern for all of us. So as I said, 40% of, of dementias could be prevented by modifying 12 risk factors. And uh, we're getting to the ones that we're gonna talk about today. So the top uh, six were minimizing diabetes, treating hypertension, preventing head injury, stopping smoking, 
reducing air pollution and reducing uh, midlife obesity. These are really about uh, direct uh, um, uh, lesions to the brain with pre uh, head injury or, or metabolic diseases such as high blood pressure or diabetes uh, or lung injuries like smoking or air pollution. And it's thought that these contribute to dementia by um, uh, furthering neuropathological damage such as amyloid or tau aggregation or vascular disease or inflammatory disease. We can also think about treating hearing impairment, maintaining frequent social contact, and assuring people have adequate uh, access to education, because we know that this contributes to an increased and maintained cognitive reserve. But I want to focus on these three. So maintaining frequent exercise, reducing the occurrence of depression, and avoiding excessive alcohol, because these three are linked with both pathophysiologic changes in the brain that are associated with neurodegenerative disease and vascular disease, as well as increased and maintained cognitive reserve. So I'm gonna share um, uh, some thoughts and uh, some studies for exercise, depression, and alcohol. And then we'll wrap things up and move to uh, discussion and questions and answer. So this is work that was done by my friend and colleague, Kirk Erickson at the University of Pittsburgh. And he studied about 150 older adults. I think they were all 72 and older and they were cognitively normal. They were um, uh, randomized to receive either uh, aerobic exercise three times a week for a year or stretching exercise three times a week for a year. And then they were followed uh, or they had uh, imaging of their brain and neuropsychological testing and some blood samples, uh, which I'll talk about uh, over the course of their exposure to either stretching or aerobic activity. And they were especially interested in changes in the hippocampus. Now the hippocampus is a part of the brain. You can see here, it's this highlighted here in yellow that is in the temporal lobes, uh, very susceptible to uh, damage from lack of oxygen. It's susceptible to damage from high levels of circulating stress hormones, and it's susceptible to neuropathological uh, 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 neurodegenerative diseases like amyloid and tau. It's an important brain structure for memory. So they wanted to know if uh, exercise, the aerobic activity was superior in uh, plumping up the hippocampus and boosting its volume. And if we look at this figure here, I'm just gonna draw your attention to the main takeaway points. The blue line here is the exercise group. The red line here is the stretching group. And there was an increased size of the hippocampus for those who were engaged in the uh, aerobic activity there was a decrease in those who only engaged in the stretching. Now, I am in no way minimizing the importance of stretching and flexibility, uh, but uh, it did not seem to have an effect on uh, brain structure. So these are scatter plots just of the aerobic exercise group because the stretching group really did not show any, any change. And they looked at correlations between the size of the hippocampus. This is the left hippocampus in this uh, column here. This is the right hippocampus here. They're both the same, the findings. So we'll just focus on this row. Um, and they looked at change in volume of oxygenation, the, the maximum. So this is really a measure of cardiovascular fitness. And the more cardiovascularly fit people became over the course of a year, there was a, it was correlated with an increase in the hippocampal volume. They also looked at a change in a brain chemical called BDNF or brain derived neurotrophic factor. I think a BDNF is sort of like miracle grow for the brain. It is a nerve growth factor that's important for neuronal genesis and for neuronal connections and for learning. And there was an association between the increase in BDNF and hippocampal volume for those who exercise, but not for those who did just the stretching. And then perhaps most importantly, they looked to see if there was a change in memory performance to see if it was correlated with hippocampal volume. And yes, indeed, uh, those who had an increase in their hippocampal volume who participated in the aerobic activity also had improvement in their memory performance. But remember, these were cognitively normal people, so they got even better. So let's move on to depression. And I think that um, I'm not gonna talk about a specific um, study here, but I want to describe how depression 
um, is thought to coexist with dementia. So the orange blocks in this diagram here are the depressive episodes. And we've broken down Alzheimer's disease into three states in the blue thing here. So there's the preclinical state where there are pathological changes happening in the brain. There is deposition of amyloid and tau is aggregating, and there may be some neurodegeneration, but there's no evidence or clinical symptoms of cognitive decline yet. The middle is the prodromal phase of dementia. We often call this mild cognitive impairment. And the third is dementia. So there's a change in uh, activities of daily living, neuropsychological performance is decreased, um, and people are, there may be personality or neuropsychiatric changes. So this is the same for all three of these. But one of the ways we understand depression and Alzheimer's disease is that people who have a depressive episode at any time in their life but certainly, especially in late life, increases the risk of developing a dementing illness by two. It may also present as part of a prodromal phase of dementia. So it could be part of the um, uh, cognitive changes. It could be mood changes that are also presenting and may predict that dementia is uh, uh, going to uh, to be present. And the third is that it's occurring as part of the symptoms of dementia. And probably about 70% of Alzheimer's patients also experience neuropsychiatric uh, changes such as depression, anxiety, irritability, sleep weight uh, changes, um, apathy, um, agitation. So it could be part of the Alzheimer's syndrome. I want to just walk you, you through, I, you don't need to remember all of this, but just to really reinforce how depression is related to the biology or pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease. So, and this is a very accessible article that I recommend uh, reviewing. It's called Depression and Underrecognized Target for Prevention of Dementia in Alzheimer's Disease. So if we start on the left here, uh, you all know this, that there is uh, uh, a neurotransmitter imbalance for many depressions. Often there is HPA axis dysregulation. That means the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis dysregulation. So the adrenal glands, which rest on top of our kidneys, which are important for the fight or flight uh, response, and they release cortisol into our system, um, communicates with our brain, the hypothalamus and the pituitary glands. And this can be dysregulated and patients with, with depression can be living in a high stress state. And as I mentioned earlier, the, hip, the hippocampus is particularly susceptible to high levels of circulating cortisol, which can, be, can uh, shrink the hippocampus. There's also a decrease in nerve growth factors. Like I said earlier, BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, is shown to decrease its, um, its presence in patients with, with depression. We also know that there is neuroinflammation. This can be part of aging, but it's worse with many chronic uh, conditions such as heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes. We can't escape the interaction between neuroinflammation, vascular disease, and depression. And all of these together contribute to the hypothesized causes of uh, Alzheimer's disease. So increase in amyloid deposition, aggregation of tau proteins and neurodegeneration, so death of cells. The last thing that I want to share with you is some ideas about alcohol use and cognitive decline. And this is a complicated um, uh, study to, to, to share in a short time, but I just want you to take home some pearls from this. And the fact that this is complicated, this well-designed study really speaks to the fact that there is conflicting evidence about um, the cognitive effects of, uh, um, of alcohol, especially in late life, but we can talk more about that. So the question of this study was, is alcohol consumption associated with the risk of dementia and cognitive decline in older adults with or without mild cognitive impairment? And so let's look at these figures here. So these are participants without mild cognitive impairment. This was a, a cohort of about 3,000 older adults from a large epidemiologic survey. Ignore these dotted lines. These are the confidence intervals and they're actually distracting. This black uh, solid line is what's important here. And if you're above zero, that means you have an increased risk. If you're below zero, you have a decreased risk. And so the weekly number of drinks, even up to 
20 drinks a week, which is a lot, um, uh, does not seem to increase the risk of conversion to dementia in patients who don't have mild cognitive impairment, at least in this study. However, those patients who did have mild cognitive impairment at baseline, remember, zero below is uh, not an increased risk, above is an increased risk. If they had 10 or more drinks a week, so that's um, at least one to two a night, um, uh, they had an increased risk of conversion to dementia. So a take home point is that among participants without mild cognitive impairment, daily low quantity drinking was associated with lower dementia risk, and that's compared with infrequent high quantity or binge drinking. I also wanna share with you that complete abstention, so not drinking at all, and consuming more than 14 drinks per week. So more than two drinks a night or binge drinking a couple of nights a week compared with drinking less than one drink a week. So maybe a drink every other week was associated with lower cognitive scores among people aged 72 years and older. And part of this is because of the effect of alcohol on the vascular system. So. Uh, alcohol is fun to drink. It feels good. It can cause euphoria and uh, feelings of well-being. Um, but we need to remember that it is a neurotoxin. It disrupts cellular activity. It disrupts the ability of cells, to, neural cells, to effectively communicate with each other, and it can disrupt uh, cell membranes. It's also it also has an effect on the vascular system. So at low doses. It is a vasodilator. It relaxes our blood vessels. At higher doses, it's a vasoconstrictor. And vasoconstriction or not getting enough blood to the brain is a bad thing for brain health. And we see here another U-shaped curve. So drinks per day, uh, zero is about, I know the odds ratio is about one. A couple of drinks seems to lower the risk of stroke, but as people drink more, their stroke risk increases. So I'm nearing the end of my talk. I'd like to leave you with a couple of thoughts uh, the first is a quote from one of my favorite authors, Oliver Sacks, who is a best-selling uh, author and neurologist. He wrote the book, Migraine and Awakenings. And he wrote about the joy of old age. I begin to feel not a shrinking, but an enlargement of mental life and perspective. One has had a long experience of life, not only one's own life, but others too. One is more conscious of transience and perhaps of beauty. At 80, one can take a long view and have a vivid, lived sense of history not possible at an earlier age. I do not think of old age as an even grimmer time that one must somehow endure and make the best of, but as a time of leisure and freedom, freed from the factitious urgencies of earlier days, free to explore whatever I wish, and to bind the thoughts and feelings of a lifetime together. I look forward to being 80. And I hope that that is the feeling of most people on this webinar and that what I've shared with you gives you some sense of hope and control over your own biology and destiny. I'll leave you with one final quote from Margaret Mead, that we are continually faced with great opportunities which are brilliantly disguised as unsolvable problems. Uh, I am a hopeful person and Alzheimer's disease and other dementias are vexing and uh, horrible illnesses, but progress is being made and will continue to be made until it is effectively uh, prevented and treated. I want to end with a special thanks to you, our interested and engaged webinar participants. I want to thank IMHR for making this webinar possible and for their more than 20 year dedication to supporting the science of mental health in Arizona. And I encourage you to check out IMHR at www.imhr.org to learn more about the organization and how you can help make a difference. I'll stop there and thanks for your attention. Thanks, Jordan. That was uh, amazing. It was such an interesting discussion. There's so many things to talk about because of the issues that you've raised and all of the information that you shared. Um, you know, one of the things that occurs to me listening to that is a lot of times when we talk about depression, I think we, we, we think of the disorder itself, right? But people use depression to mean a lot of subclinical kinds of depression feelings too. Like a lot of the research 
that's done on depression is done mostly on subclinical kinds of things, right? It's not always on disorders per se, but a lot of information also on subclinical kinds of depression or, or the kinds of things that people experience every day, really, that don't meet criteria for disorder, but we all know what depression feels like. Right. OK. Um, so what about these subclinical parts of that? I mean, do we know anything about, you know, the everyday experience of depression that may not be real disorder, but nevertheless can have a, an effect on the way people feel right and its connections to um, cognitive decline? Sure. So um, I agree. Uh, depression is a problem, but the majority of people uh, are not clinically depressed. And that is a great thing. It speaks to the resilience of the human condition. Um, a lot of people do have subclinical depression. Um, and while it's a different experience, uh, for some people, it's not as disabling. Um, but it still makes me concerned because people who have subthreshold depression are at increased risk of developing a major depressive episode. Um, People who have subclinical depression often are just still suffering, even if they don't need a medical diagnosis, their lives are not as good as they should be. And third, subclinical depression for many people can be treated. So um, I'm, I'm concerned that there may be some discounting of the effects it can have on people's lives. And while um, not everybody needs to be on a medicine, and I, I like to prescribe lots of non-medical interventions, psychotherapy, uh, increased exercise, uh, mindfulness approaches, um, being more social can all have an effect on reducing subclinical depression. Yeah, important. You know, um, uh, one of the other things that occurred to me listening to this was, was really, I love to focus on the idea that that there are modifiable factors, right? That we can do something about this, right? Okay. And a lot of those are entirely within our grasp, right? To do something about, right? That aren't really tremendously difficult. Well, I can say that behavior change is always difficult, right? <laughs> but, but that's, that's um, why I picked these three particular uh, variables because people have some control over them. Right. And, and I think that's important. So a couple of things that occurred to me listening to that, right? Is that you mentioned 12 factors, but we don't need to modify all 12 to have an impact on cognitive decline. Would that be correct? Yes, thank you for clarifying that. Um, th these are um, these are factors that are have been identified as having a synergistic or additive effect on the risk of conversion to dementia. And so reducing any of the burden of these factors uh, can have an impact. And it's really not... Um, we can't we can't change everything right. the behavior right. change is challenging and some of them are out of our hand because we may not have had um, a great education or we we weren't able to finish school so um, not having access to a, a great education is not something that is modifiable if you're an older adult right exactly so um so really this kind of relates to the idea of sort of like a cumulative risk kind of model for prediction of, you know, cognitive decline, right? That the more of those that you have that, you know, prevent greater risk, right? Well said, yes. Oh, okay. All right. Well, so then that leads me to one other sort of issue that I'd love you to talk about is that are those, I mean, I think you implied that they're not equally weighted, right? Yes, are I don't. Um, I doubt that they're equally weighted, and I don't remember from the article if, if these variables were actually weighted. Uh, that's a great question. I don't know if there's a different um, uh, intensity that each one carries for mm -hmm. risk. I mean, because if we only have so much capacity for change, mm -hmm. right, then you might want to say, well, which is the most important one of these, right, that I can do something or sh I should do something about if I have to choose, right? Should I cut down on alcohol? Should I go to therapy? What, you know, I mean, or should I would I tell you what I, what I think are, what, what are the number one and the number two modifiable risk factors for dementia that is from a weighted study are increasing physical activity and preventing and treating depression. I would say that number three, because it's too simple to just think that Alzheimer's disease uh, is just related to the pathology of Alzheimer's, of uh, Alzheimer's uh, amyloid and tau. It really is for the majority of people an interaction of this neurodegeneration and vascular disease. So in addition to increasing physical activity, preventing and treating depression, making sure that um, 
cardiovascular disease, especially hypertension and diabetes are well controlled or prevented is probably the most important thing that things can, that people can do. There is a, a, a burgeoning literature describing the interaction of cognitive decline and diabetes and diabetes leads to uh, small bleeds in the brain, what we call white matter hyperintensities that we can see in MRI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, important. Great. Thank you for that. Um, you know, I want to get to the Q&A part of this in just a sec here, right? But um, just because we didn't get the poll results from the first poll up, right? Um, and I, we do have those results, just so everybody knows. And it's not probably very surprising that um, the thing that people were most concerned about hearing about was or, or learning about is the loss of mental acuity, right? And that's really what you focused on throughout this whole um, uh, webinar. So I think that we hit on the thing that people were most concerned about learning about, right? Um, and if you're set, we can move to the Q&A part of this. Sure, whatever's most helpful for the audience. Okay, well, um, I've got a number of questions that have been submitted. So let me read them and you can respond to them as they come. All right. Um, so one of the questions is uh, whether or not there might be memory enhancing products that you can recommend to people. Uh, so memory enhancing products for people who are not uh, diagnosed with dementia. Uh, I think that that's perhaps, perhaps what this person is asking about. Um, I think that the best memory enhancing products are making sure that cardiovascular diseases are effectively prevented and treated. There's not enough evidence that supplements such as ginkgo biloba, uh, magnesium uh, really provide memory enhancing benefits. Um, drugs such as Aricept are not indicated for people with mild cognitive impairment. Now, they're often prescribed, um, I think erroneously, usually by primary care doctors. It's for people with uh, mild to moderate uh, uh, dementia. And it doesn't really boost cognition that much, but it can delay or slow down decline and keep people living in the community a little bit longer than if they weren't. Um, but I don't recommend particular supplements or agents to enhance cognition. Yeah, some folks um, uh, have asked about whether or not these slides can be made available, right? Um, I don't know how you feel about that, but I'm happy to share them, sure. Okay, well then I'm sure that we'll be able to get them up on our website and people could access them that way. So um, so we have a question also that, you know, what effect do antidepressants have on the slowing of the aging brain? Those on antidepressants versus those not on medication. No, I, I love that question. So there is a, a, a large preclinical um, body of evidence. So. Uh, work done with rodents that suggests that SSRIs may delay the deposition of amyloid and slow cognitive decline uh, and also improve uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factors. So this miracle grow for the brain that we want to have boosted. Um, the evidence is murkier in humans as it always is, but there is a large important study that shows that patients who um, were treated with an SSRI, a serotonin uh, medication or a serotonin norepinephrine medication like duloxetine or venlafaxine uh, do have a delay in conversion from normal to mild cognitive impairment to dementia. Uh, it's hard to say if this is a direct benefit of the medication or if it's a benefit from their, uh, their depression being treated. Um, but at that point, it doesn't really matter. What's, what's important is to get some treatment that helps your depression because that's important for your cognition. Great, thanks. Um, another question was, have studies been done into recreational drug use and dementia? And there was a related question down the list a little bit, um, also asking about the use of psychedelics in treating dementia? Yeah, I, um, so recreational drug use and risk of dementia or treat, treatment of dementia? Um, How would you frame that question, Keith? I would frame that probably looking at risk uh -huh. more than treatment. I'm thinking, um, I'm, I'm guessing what that, what that is. Sure, sure. So, I mean, the most common recreational drug besides alcohol is marijuana. Um, Marijuana does, I mean, it's, it's helpful for some medical conditions. 
Um, it also does have a negative effect on focus, attention, and memory. Um, I think that there is a, I don't know who's funding the study, but there is a study of uh, marijuana. I forget if it's oral or I think it's ingested for patients with advanced dementia who are having uh, irritability and behavior problems to see if uh, marijuana or THC is superior to placebo. I think that the evidence is really still out on that. In, in terms of psychedelics, I, I can't imagine how the, uh, the mechanism of action or the experience and the goal of psychedelics is really to provide insight when used in a medical uh, situation like OCD or depression. Um, I think there's value of studying psychedelics um, in end of life situations or with cancer because it really can reduce people's anxiety about dying. Um, I don't know about any research that's been done with dementia, but um, I'm sure that somebody will do it because uh, psychedelics are all the rage to study now. Right, that's certainly true, huh? Um, all right, another question is peripheral neuropathy related to vascular or brain degeneration ultimately? Does, uh, and related to that, some, an interesting mask specific question, right? Does wearing masks, right, during COVID affect some impeding of oxygen intake in senior adults? Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to, to respond to the first part of the question about peripheral neuropathy, but I have wondered that myself about um, uh, change in oxygen tension and an increase in exposure to carbon dioxide when wearing a mask. Um, I don't know the answer to this. I think it's a very interesting, but I, but I can't imagine that uh, there would be such a reduction in oxygen uh, uh, tension that it would affect somebody's uh, brain function. Okay, um, Angel, I see a note from you. Did you want to say something? Maybe not. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So another question had to do with the idea of how much exercise is actually required to see benefit. Yeah, no, that I, I love that question too. So these studies are uh, of exercise to prevent cognitive decline, uh, to prevent depression, um, to improve cognition um, are done under uh, very close uh, laboratory conditions where people need to get up to a certain level of, uh, uh, I, I forget what the heart rate is, and they're often wearing those masks that measure their, uh, the ratio of oxygen to carbon dioxide. It, it has been recommended that people should exercise to the point where it is challenging for them to talk. So they're huffing a little bit, but I'm hesitant to make that recommendation on this webinar because everybody's medical and cardiovascular status is different. Um, we know that any exercise is superior to none. And it seems that um, uh, cardiovascular aerobic activity is probably better than, um, than other ac exercise, but I would encourage people to do whatever they can and to talk with their doctors about what is safe for them. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, a question about what types of things would you include in cognitive training? So there's a lot of um, uh, uh, products that are available uh, like apps, Lumosity is an example of one of these. Um, I, I think that that's probably a good start, uh, Googling cognitive training and starting out with perhaps a free app, but, but there are things for, for purchase. I, I am not an expert in cognitive uh, training apps, um, uh, but they're certainly out there and uh, people can explore that. Okay. Um, so uh, one attendee asked if you could briefly address the um, thinking around the genetic component of these connections. Sure, I, um, I think that the most important genetic component for people to think about is the APOE4 uh, genotype. So this has been established over and over to, uh, and, and it's, uh, we can think of it as a protein that carries <coughs> cholesterol in the body. And people who have two copies of this allele are more at risk of developing uh, uh, Alzheimer's dementia, um, and it may interact in a 
more negative way with some of these modifiable risk factors that we've talked about. That's the big one that people should, should know about. I in no way am, am suggesting that people should go and get uh, genetic testing for this because it's not modifiable. What is modifiable is knowing what their cholesterol load is and their triglyceride lo load and making sure that it's well controlled. Okay. Um, one question uh, asks about, what about Parkinson's disease? Okay, so oh. I'm not sure exactly what the focus of that was meant to be, but I'm sure you'll have some idea. Okay, so um, people know what Parkinson's disease is, and um, the most common, commonly known symptoms of Parkinson's disease are tremor and slowed movements, and it's a, a disease of the, uh, the basal ganglia part of the brain. Um, I don't remember the exact percentage, but uh, uh, a significant uh, percentage of patients who have Parkinson's also develop dementia or other neuropsychiatric changes, such as apathy, anxiety, or personality changes. Uh, they are also at increased risk of depression. Um, there is a different kind of dementing illness that often uh, goes along with Parkinson's. It's called Lewy body disease. And um, there's some different presentations with Lewy body disease. There can be more uh, behavioral uh, changes or disinhibition, um, and it can be a spectrum. So it can be movement disorder of uh, Parkinson's, and then it can develop into the Lewy body dementia with the memory and cognitive changes and uh, some of the personality changes. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, good. Um, we only have a couple more minutes and there's tons more questions as you're probably not surprised to hear. We'll do what we can. And I'm sorry if we can't get to everyone's question here, but one is I work full time along with taking care of a long-term disabled spouse. Depression is hard to avoid in this situation. Any good reading resources to recommend? Yes, so I would recommend um, looking at the Alzheimer's Association uh, website. There's also a website called caregiver.com uh, or dot, uh, .org. Um, there are many Facebook groups for caregivers, um, and it's important to monitor yourself for depression, for changes in sleep. Um, there, are, there are things that you can do. So you should talk to your own doctor about getting treated for depression. Uh, there is respite care that is available. It's more challenging during COVID, but um, uh, there are a lot of options. You are the person keeping that ship afloat, so it's important that you take care of yourself. Okay, good. Thank you. So um, uh, this may be our last question. We'll see <laughs> if we've got time for more. But So this uh, uh, attendee writes, I had COVID. Since then, I've been particularly concerned about post-COVID cognitive decline. What do we know about this? What signs do I look for that would be a signal to see my doctor? So um, there's different thoughts about how COVID or long COVID can affect cognitive function. One is if patients really um, developed a bad pneumonia and they had um, problems with proper oxygenation of their brain, there could be brain damage. There is also thought that, um, I mean, it's a, uh, an upper respiratory infection uh, through the nose, there can be direct access to the brain and there can be some uh, vascular and neural inflammation from it. Um, some of the, the big concerns are uh, psychiatric changes, so depression, anxiety. There have also been reports of uh, psychotic symptoms in some patients. Uh, some patients with long COVID are reporting brain fog, as well as um, uh, uh, just feeling slowed down and trouble with concentrating. Um, I think that if you're experiencing any of these for your own peace of mind and to see if your doctor thinks that you need a referral, uh, chat with your doctor and see what she says. Okay. Great, thanks. I think we have time for one more. So I'm gonna consolidate a couple of questions that I see here in the, in the Q&A list, right? And this has to do, or these questions have to do with sleep and sleep deprivation um, or, or less sleep time and cognitive decline, right? Mm -hmm. Connections there, what are you thinking? Or what should people be concerned about? 
Yeah, no, I, that, that's a fabulous question. Um, and there's work done by a, a great researcher at UCSF named Christine Yaffe, Y-A-F-F-E, who has studied the interaction of insomnia and, um, uh, and cognitive decline and dementia. And there is a link. So people who have worse sleep are more at risk of developing cognitive decline. She has also done uh, um, translational assays, so studies of the brain that shows that people have more sort of a cellular debris left over in their brain if they don't sleep well at night. There's almost like a housekeeping effect of cellular activity during uh, sleep. There's also concern about obstructive sleep apnea and cognitive decline and dementia. And obstructive sleep apnea affects about 20% of community dwelling older adults. It's, uh, as, it's, as its name says, it is a relaxation of the soft palate. So if you touch the top of your mouth, with your tongue behind that, it's soft. That relaxes during sleep, and then people gasp and they wake up. But they don't know they wake up. These are micro arousals, but they're very tired the rest of the day. They may be nodding off. Their spouse or bed partner may notice that there are some apnea or uh, periods where they're not breathing, and then they snort. And this is a risk for further cognitive decline because the brain is exposed to uh, continuous intermittent periods of low oxygen tension. Okay. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna end our Q&A portion here um, as we're coming close to the end of our, our time. Um, so I wanna thank you, Jordan, very much for all of your time and expertise and sharing so many wonderful things with us today. And I wanna thank everyone in the audience who joined us as well. It's inspiring to learn about the work that you do and how mental health work is really important to our well-being, both as individuals as well as a community, right? Um, and I want to encourage everyone uh, to learn how you can connect and help the IMHR or the Institute for Mental Health Research. Please visit our website um, at www.imhr.org, not com, but org. Our website also features mental health resource page, including crisis lines if you are struggling or need help. We'll be sending everyone a follow-up survey and would really appreciate your feedback. It helps us to continue providing programming on the areas that most matter to you for us to present. So please take a minute uh, to complete the survey. It makes a difference. And I promise you that we all look at these and we plan our programming based on the input that we get. Information on our 2022 webinar series will be provided soon. You can also check our website um, for updates on those webinars, also what research grants we've been funding and, and exploring, and the opportunities to get involved. We're currently accepting donations, as well as volunteers, and would really enjoy speaking with everyone who might have an interest about those opportunities. I'd like to leave you all with a final thought, and that's that mental health effects of the pandemic are going to be felt for many years to come. We've learned today here that there are always ways when we can protect our brain health starting now, and we can apply this knowledge to ourselves as well as to our aging loved ones and those we care for. This is an opportunity to learn from mental health research to make our lives better over time. And this is the reason the Institute for Mental Health Research persists in the work that we do, funding new and innovative research and bringing webinars like these to the community. So thank you again for everyone for joining us and have a